Welcome everybody to the Tubishvat edition of Judaism 201. I'm going to do a share screen with my source sheet here. All right. Those of us who are involved in the COVID shutdown, we often lose track of time um, and or we find it hard to remember what day it is. Um, Time seems very distorted. Um, some days seem slow, but it's also flying by. So I don't want to scare anybody, but uh, four weeks from now is Purim. And that means, and four weeks after that is Pesach. So two months to Pesach, everybody. Um, <clears throat> pretty much every shear on Tu B'Shvat starts the same way, which is what is Tu B'Shvat and what's the source? And so, Almost every shear starts with this same quote. Hold on one second. Uh, okay, so what is the source of Tu B'Shvat? The source comes from tractate, uh, from Mishnah Rosh Hashanah. Uh, Mishnah Rosh Hashanah is not just about Rosh Hashanah or the tractate of Gemara Rosh Hashanah is not just about Rosh Hashanah. It's also, there's also a lot about Rosh Chodesh and um, seeing the new moon uh, and those kinds of issues. And actually, it's sort of, it's a relatively easy tractate if you want to delve into learning Mishnah or learning Gemara. Uh, Mishnah Rosh, uh, tractate Rosh Hashanah is, is a nice one to start with in terms of uh, ease, ease of, of learning. The Mishnah tells us there are four New Years. So that in itself um, is not necessarily so odd. We have many kinds of New Years ourselves, if you think about it. We have a secular year, we have a tax year, the government has a fiscal year, um, there's a school year, and it's the same thing in Judaism. On the first of Nisan is a New Year for Kings. So when we read in the in the Chumash, it was the, or in Tanakh, you know, it was the 12th year of David and Melech's reign. Um, they're, they're counting from the first of Nisan. And there's also for the order of the festivals, meaning, you know, we consider a, a, a cycle of festivals, Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot in that order. Um, and we also know that the, uh, we count the months from Nisan uh, in the Torah. So Nisan's the first month. Um, ER is the second month, Tishrei, which is where, where we think of Russia as being in um, Tishrei in the Torah is the seventh month. And the rest of this Mishnah is actually a lot about taxes. Actually, there's a base tax rate of around 22%. We give the, of our grain and our fruits, our produce, we give the first 2% to the Kohen. And then we give 10% to the Levium. And then we give another 10% that we either have to uh, redeem and spend in Yerushalayim, um, or we have to give it to the poor, depending on the year. So we do the animal tithes, where we give one out of every 10 animals to the Levium. And we group them, um, the ones that were born before the first of Elul and the ones that were born after the first of Elul. Because you can't mix up your tithe. You need to do a, a, a set of tithes for each year. Um, although there's actually two opinions on that. Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Shimon say that the new year for, so to speak, for animals is on the first of Tishrei. <clears throat> also, the first of Tishrei is how we count the years, the calendar years, which and we all know that, 5781, 5782. That's our, what we think of as Rosh Hashanah. Um, it's also how we count every seven years for the Shemitah year and every 50 years for Yovel, and also for planting trees. Um, there is a Torah law that you cannot eat fruit from a tree that's under three years old. The first three years of a tree, you, you can eat the fruit. Um, and by the way, that halacha applies today. So if you have a fruit tree in your backyard, um, you can't eat the tree the first three years. Um, the first of Tishrei is also the tax year for vegetables. And then the tax year for trees. Now, so we see actually there's two New Year's for trees. 
there's the one rule which we just talked about, Orla, which is that you can't eat fruit from the first three years, but there's also the taxing year that we have to give, because we were just talking about before, the, the 10% um, of our fruit. Um, so that dividing line is either on the first of Shabbat, according to Beis Shammai, or it's on the 15th of Shabbat, or more commonly known as Tu B'Shvat, um, according to Beis Hillel. We're going to return to that. And I want to talk about the mitzvah of matzah, which actually this is from last week's Parsha, this Pasuk. The Pasuk says, you should guard the matzahs for on this day, it brought you out of Eretz Mitzrayim. You should observe this day throughout the generations uh, for all time. So let's look at the Hebrew here. I bolded it. Um, Ushmar Tem in both places. And the word shamor in its most basic form means guard, uh, but it can also mean observe. And actually this Pasuk, it uses it in both ways at once. They guard the matzahs and observe. And what they mean is uh, either observe this commandment or, or you should observe the holiday of Pesach um, throughout the generations. So we see, for example, when um, Shomer Shabbos means you observe the mitzvahs of Shabbos uh, is a way that uh, um, Shamar is, is used to mean observe. Um, I should also mention that this Pasuk, the first part, Ushmar Tem Et HaMatzos, uh, that is the source for using Shmura Matzah at the Passover Seder. So according to many, it's not a chumr, it's not a strictness, but, uh, but that you should really use shmur matzah, uh, at least for the, the mitzvah of matzah at, at your seder and the mitzvah of uh, afikomen, you should use shmur matzah. Okay, and so Rashi brings a, 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 a halachic midrash called Mechelta de Rebbe Yishmael. And he does a little bit of a word play here says, and you shall guard the matzahs. Rabbi Yoshaya, Yoshaya says, don't read it as you shall guard the matzahs, but rather you should read it as you shall guard the mitzvahs. And if we look on the Hebrew here, uh, matzos and mitzvahs are spelled exactly the same way. So that's why he's just saying change the vowels. Um, and in the Torah, we have a tradition of what the vowels are, but if you look in a safer Torah, there are no vowels, so it's, it's, it's fair game to do that. He says, just as matzahs are not permitted to become chametz, in other words, you can't leave them around, so a mitzvah should not become chametz. You shouldn't like leave a mitzvah around. Um, it'll get soured, so to speak. And if the opportunity of mitzvah presents itself, you should do it right away. Um, so, the rabbinic commentaries, of course, ask the most obvious question, which is that, okay, so we have this idea that you should do mitzvahs right away, fair enough. The question is, why is it that this thought presented specifically in the context of the Exodus, of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim? Why, why, I guess that's, that's the question, why not anywhere else, why here? Um, and the answer, as some of the commentators say, it's in order to uh, contrast the, uh, the proper Jewish way, uh, the proper Jewish conduct, conduct with the Egyptian view. Um, I want to look at uh, number four here. Well, let me just, so some of the, some of the commentators say that, um, that the Mitzri, the Egyptians were lazy. So first you're gonna say lazy, they have like the most magnificent, you know, the, the library at Alexandria and, and the pyramids. And the answer is, yeah, they made their slaves do all that stuff. That's why they needed so many slaves because they were lazy. And not only that, but they also embodied this concept of procrastination. And this is reflected in a very subtle, uh, very subtle thing that goes on at the end of the second plague, which is source number four here. So the second plague is the frogs. Paro summons Moshe and Aaron and says, please to Hashem, get the frogs out of here. And Moshe says, okay, and I will grant you, you know, 
you tell me when you want me to end the plague. So if you were Paro, what would you say? You'd say, as soon as possible. Or maybe you'd say uh, metaphorically, you know, I want it done yesterday. And what does he say? He says, eh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. It's like the frogs are like really hassling all, all the everybody, right? And he says, eh, get rid of them tomorrow. The idea is that um, is that th this is this this is one of the middos of the mitzri is procrastination, laziness. Now, um, in the symbology of the Zohar, uh, the Zohar compares Mitzrayim to a donkey or a chamor. A donkey never seems in a hurry. Um, chamor also can mean physical substance. I think. Uh, clay or something can be chamor and more generally it symbolizes physical substance and in standard uh, mystical thought um, chamor often refers to materialism or gashmias um, and the Zohar uses as its support uh, the following two psukim so one's from Yecheskel uh, where it just says in Eretz and Shrine, we're like those of donkeys um, and by the way if you take the letters of chamor and you rearrange them, you get the word machor, machar, which means tomorrow. Um, and this is another source that the Zohar uses. Uh, right before Akedas Yitzchak, Avram says to his youths, you stay here with the donkey. And his youths were these two assistants and Yishmael, who's the considered the father of the Arabic people. So you stay here with the donkey. And the idea is that, again, just connecting the Mitzri to the, uh, to the donkey. Now, this procrastination is in direct contrast to our situation, Mitzrayim. Uh, this also is a Pasuk from last week's Parsha. Um, this is how you should eat the matzah um, with your loins girded. So, I, you know, I looked up what loins girded means. Um, and back in the old days, what it meant was, you know, back when everybody was wearing robes, it was sort of referring to the men. It was saying, you know, you should uh, take your, take the bottom part of your robe and stick it in your belt. And girded, you know, meant, you know, with a belt. I guess that's where the word girdle comes from. But uh, what they meant was, uh, you know, get ready to go. Your sandals on your feet, your staff, and you shall eat it hurriedly. A big word, uh, the Gemara discusses this word a lot. Um, it's a big word, chipazon. It meant that they left in great haste. We probably, uh, we might be, I'm sure we use that word chipazon in the Haggadah. I'm not sure if we use this exact pasuk or not. I can't remember. Um, and we see the contrast again here. You should not eat anything leavened with it seven days, eat matzah. For you departed, we all know this, right? You departed from Eretz Mitzrayim bechipazon in a hurry, right? We, we, we couldn't let the, the bread rise so that you may remember the day of your departure for as long as you live. Um, so, so this is the whole idea of, of contrasting the Mitzri, you're supposed to be lazy and compared to a donkey with the way that we're supposed to do mitzvahs, which is uh, hurriedly, right? And we go back to the, to the, to the first uh, Pasuk that I showed up there for the first Medrash, which says that uh, that matzahs, you know, don't read it as, as matzahs in a hurry, just just like your bread can turn sour and become chametz if you leave it around, you know, your mitzvahs also will be spoiled if you leave them around. All right, so, uh, so matzah is the epitome of alacrity. Um, so now let's go back to Tu uh, So at, at the beginning, we read that Tu according to Beis Shammai, is on the first of Shvat, and Beis Hillel says the 15th or Tu So the Gemara then explores, all right, so what's the, what's the basis for, where do they really disagree? So in a second, it says, um, uh, what's the reason Rabbi Lazar said that Rabbi Oshaya said the reason is that most of the year's rains have already fallen. Um, okay, so what does Beis Hillel say to that? 
um, does he argue that the rains have not already fallen by then? And actually the Gemara never tells us, um, it never tells us why Base Hillel uh, chooses the 15th of Shvat. So in order to understand why he's choosing that, one way to analyze that would be to see, well, where else does Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel, uh, where else do they disagree? And maybe we can find a common pattern. Um, one of the most famous disagreements between Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai, probably most of us know this, is, Beis, is uh, how we light candles on Hanukkah. Beis Shammai says, I'm sure we all know this, right? So you're supposed to, they say you're supposed to light eight days first, uh, uh, eight candles on the first day, and then seven candles on the second day, and six candles and you're going down. And Beis Hillel says, no, you light one candle the first day, two the second day, and so on. That's the way we light. Again, the question is, well, what do they actually disagree on? Certainly, this is not personal preference. They, there's some, un, some fundamental underlying thing going on here. Um, that they disagree on. So let's pick two more. Um, there is a disagreement on what you should say when you do Havdalah. We say, Berei Morei Ha'esh, um, creates the lights of the fire. And Beis Shammai says, it should be Bara Maor Ha'esh, created the light of the fire. Um, and Beis Shammai says, there is only one light. And Beis Hillel says, no, there's a lot of lights. Like, what are you talking? In fact, we have to do Havdalah with two candles. I, what, what's Beis Shammai talking about? We'll get back to that. So that's another Machlokas. And here's a more subtle one. We know that we cannot do work on Shabbos. However, our utensils can do work. Now, I should say there's a big exception about cooking. You can't just like, you know, uh, leave like your bread in the oven at the beginning of Shabbos and, and, and cook it all throughout. So besides cooking, generally speaking, our utensils are allowed to do work for us on Shabbos. So you're not allowed to trap on Shabbos, but if you set a mouse trap on Friday, that's no problem. Um, and if it, if it traps, your mouse on Shabbos, it's, it's your trap that did it. It's not you that did it. Beis Shammai says that you can only do that if there's enough time remaining on Friday for them to get trapped. I'm not exactly sure what that means, practicality. It seems to me if you set a mouse trap, a, a mouse can get trapped right away, but ignore that point. Um, the main thing is he, he says there needs to be potential time that that the malacha, that the work, that the trapping can actually happen um, on the Friday. It, it doesn't actually, it doesn't have to happen on Friday, but there needs to be enough time on Friday for it to happen. And Beis Hillel says, no, you can do it one second before Shabbos is fine. So what's the fundamental disagreement here? And we see actually that there's a common thread if we look at it in one way, there's a common thread with all of them. Let me start with the lights here, the, the Hanukkah candle lights. Beis Shammai is talking about potential, and Beis Hillel is talking about actuality. So how do I apply that to these three machlokas and these three disagreements? Beis Shammai is saying on the first day of Hanukkah, you have eight days left. There's a potential of eight days. And so you should light eight candles. Base Hillel says, but in actuality, we're only on the first day. So you light one candle. Okay. Let's go to the prayer for Havdalah. For Havdalah, so why do we care about uh, fire on Havdalah? So it goes back to the very first Motzi Shabbos that was in Gan Eden. And Adam and Chava were there. And on Motzi Shabbos, they became scared. It was getting dark. And so there's two different stories. One of them is that God presented them with fire. Another one was that Adam and Chava were the first Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. Um, and they, you know, with the flint thing and, and made a fire. 
the point is that they, they made the first fire and that's what we're celebrating or we're marking. A fire was brought into the world for use of mankind. And Beis Shammai says that um, we say bara mara, which is all in the past tense, that what we're celebrating is that Hashem uh, made a fire and all the fires that ever came after that came from that one. In other words, that first fire was the potential for everything. Beis Hillel says, no, we go by what is right now. And what is right now is you're holding up two flames. And not only that, but Beis Hillel says, you know, it's counting all the different colors as different flames. So Beis Hillel says there's a lot of them and they're right now and you can see them right now. So I say, Borei Morei Haesh. And it's a similar thing on this uh, third one, spreading traps. Beis Shammai says, when you set a trap, it has to have the potential of actually accomplishing its job on Friday um, before Shabbos. And Beis Hillel says, no, in actuality, as long as a trap is set on Friday, you're fine. So now let's go to Tu Bishvat, or the birthday of the trees. Beis Shammai is saying that now that the rainy season is over, your tree's good. It's got the potential to have buds and fruit come out of it. You're all good now that, that the, uh, most of the rain has come by. And Base Hillel says, that's not good enough. Potential isn't good enough. We need to see actuality. So in his view, buds and, um, and the flowerings of the trees are what counts. The actuality is what counts. So let's, uh, oops, let me go. To, so let, now let's, let's tie the two together and see what, see what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about the difference of potentiality versus actuality. Um, let's look at one more it, really interesting interpretation, also from last week's Pasuk and also right from the Haggadah. And you shall explain to your son on that day, it is because of what Hashem did for me when I went out from Mitzrayim. I'm sure we all remember that one. I think that's the answer to one of the four questions, right? To, uh, we say to one of the four sons, Right, he got it a hahu on that very day. Lemur, you should say, you know, for the sake of this. Um, and maybe even we're supposed to point at the matzah or something, I forget, because of this. Um, another interpretation, if you look at the bold, by yom hahu can also mean uh, not necessarily on that day. But in that day, and what uh, one of the rabbis want to suggest is that you can tell your children that we lived in the day, and that's why Hashem redeemed us. We didn't dwell in the past. The fact that, you know, it really stunk that we had to be slaves for this long. We didn't dwell in the past. Uh, and we didn't put stuff off till tomorrow. But we lived in the present each day. We took it as it comes and we dealt with it. Um, and that's a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting idea here. You know, we all know that uh, if COVID has taught us anything, it's taught us that there's a, it reminded us that there's a whole lot that we cannot control. Um, however, one of the things we can control is how we view things and how we react to it. Um, let's take this idea Really, let's take this to an, an extreme idea. There's a very famous teshuva by uh, one of the great uh, Rishonim called the Radvaz. Um, and actually, I had heard of this before. I thought it was just a hypothetical question. And uh, the last time I heard about it, apparently it was a real teshuva because the premise of this teshuva sounds crazy. But apparently, apparently it's a, it was a real question that he had to answer. And the question was, I'm in prison and the authorities said that I can come out one day a year, what day should I choose? And the right, you know, so let's think, uh, maybe you should come out on a Shabbos, right? Be able to observe Shabbos. Maybe you should come out on Yom Kippur. Um, you can spend all day in shul asking for teshuva. Maybe he should come out on Purim. Um, you know, the, the mitz even though the mitzvahs are not, um, are not ranked in importance 
uh, the commentators break that rule all the time. And they say that the mitzvah of hearing the gill is one of the most important mitzvahs. Um, and this is what his answer was. His answer was, ask to get out the first day that you can, which I thought was really interesting. And it, it perfectly fits with this theory that, that when it comes to mitzvahs, you do what you can do now. And you deal with tomorrow's situation tomorrow. That, certainly that doesn't mean that you know, we don't plan for tomorrow. Here's an interesting question. Uh, the Radva does not pose this, but I often wonder how he would answer this. Um, suppose, again, just making up a hypothetical, suppose on Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the, of the year, first of Tishrei, your doctor says you can only fast one day per month. So should the person fast on the third of Tishrei, which is Tzom Gedalia? Or if Yom Kippur is more important, should he wait till the 10th of Tishrei and, and fast, fast on that day? Um, I'm not answering that. And I, I don't know if, if anybody has answered that one, but I'll just, I'll just leave that and, and come back to the present and, and learn about our lessons today. Um, the lesson, to, you know, we're all in this crazy lockdown COVID stuff. It's now like, what, the 10th month of this, and we're all going crazy. And I think the message here is that we can't mope around looking backwards and, you know, dwelling on those things that we have missed. You know, everybody's got their own story. I'll throw mine in. I've missed, you know, the last six months, at least, of uh, my only grandchild growing up. Um, she's not even two, like a third of her life. I haven't been able to see her. Um, can't dwell on that. And we also can't dwell, spend all our time on daydreaming about things that we'll do in the future. Of course, it doesn't mean not to have any plan. You know, I'm, we're working, my wife is working on plans for a, for a summer vacation. Um, but but we don't sit around and, and think, you know, oh, I got this great house project and then turn into Paro and say, and you know when we'll do it? tomorrow, tomorrow, we need to live, live primarily in the here and now. Um, the Yetzir Hara has many strategies. And one strategy is procrastination. I know that uh, the Yetzir Hara gets me on that one a lot. Um, so, so during this crazy time, which has gone on for too long, we need to create moments and then live in those moments. Zoom sessions with family and friends, and we need to rein in that Yetzir Hara where everything is, eh, I'll do it. I got, you know, with this COVID stuff, I got lots of time. I'll do it tomorrow. Um, we need to control what we control. We need to be like Avraham. And I want to share uh, a perfect ending to this uh, and how the Kabbalists interpret this. This last quote here, Avraham arose early in the morning and saddled his donkey. This is at the beginning of the Akedah. If ever there was a mitzvah that somebody would procrastinate, it's a mitzvah that says to sacrifice your son. Um, and the Yetzir Hara was working overtime with Avraham. And Avraham, instead, he looked his Yetzir Hara right in the eye. Um, you know, and, and you can think of it as, you know, the donkey that, that this procrastination aspect of Zichahara, he looked him right in the eye and said, I'm in control of you. And I, he saddled his donkey early in the morning. And, and this is this idea that he, he was going to do what Hashem wanted him to do and not use, not use any excuse to, to put it off. So according to Beis Hillel, when Tu Bishvat comes, it's when we start to see the buds followed by the fruits. When it's here in actuality, that's when we celebrate Tu Bishvat. And so, tying us all together, my bracha to all of you is that we get renewed strength to defeat our Yitzhahara in all its forms, and that we see those buds and fruits in our lives, bin haraviyamenu, speedily in our day. <laughs>